Um, it's great to be at this wonderful event. Um, we all go back to bluegrass music. Uh, I was first exposed to it in the uh, early 80s to any degree. And uh, we had some great volunteers who were so important at uh, WAMU in those early years with the concerts we put on. We used to have, I guess, a couple concerts a year for a while there. And people, um, some folks who passed away that were volunteers at the station, I just wanted to acknowledge them. Gary Hutzel, Lindsay Edmonds, Pixie Christie, Richard Hardesty, great people. And uh, Carol Thompson and Pixie Christie did the, uh, the concert listings for us. And they were very long, weren't they, Gary? <laughs> three or four minutes to, to mention all the different bars and, and, and all the, the national acts that were coming through town too, but uh, Carol and Pixie were very important at the station and uh, a lot of those folks didn't get the acknowledgement that they deserved, but I just wanted to acknowledge them now. I also wanted to acknowledge uh, Bill Brown, who was, who was the program director at WAMU back, uh, back in the day, in the 70s. And he happens to be married to uh, our own Katie Daly. They met at the station. I met my wife at the station too. Laurie Dempsey, Laurie Clevenger, who was the volunteer coordinator at the station. And uh, we met uh, back around uh, 81, 82, and uh, right, right before I started doing bluegrass shows. So thank you, uh, Laurie. And uh, let's see, Kitty Kuykendall. Bluegrass, and she is the queen of bluegrass for, for now and forever. And uh, of course, she and her husband, uh, Pete Cotton, are also very important in the uh, history of, of bluegrass music. <laughs> Some other musicians among us, uh, Brad Kalabri, who's our host, but he's also a great musician. Uh, here also Michelle Burner. Uh, he does a show for us, he's a, a local musician and songwriter of note. Ira Gitlin, Mike Marceau uh, are here. And uh, Tony Connell and Sally Love are uh, over here. <laughs> Tara Winhart, and uh, let's see who else do we have. Uh, Walt Michael, Walt Michael is here as well. And, uh, and so we, uh, thank them for being here today. Back in 1967, if you read in your uh, your book there, uh, the details of the uh, day in 1967 when these two guys got together and uh, did a radio show, they convinced uh, management to uh, put on an educational show, not so much an entertainment show, but an educational show, which really was entertaining at the same time. But uh, Dick was the host, Gary was the engineer slash producer, I guess you'd say, right? More engineer. Engineer, did you ever did you ever host any of those early shows? Or? Uh, I, when uh, Dick decided to leave for the, the show, uh, I took over for, for the remainder of our contract, I guess. And then shortly after that was Saturday Bluegrass. Yes, mm -hmm. Saturday Bluegrass, mm -hmm. <laughs> which was, was the, the show. If you had to pick out one show, uh, that would have been the show that was really the uh, the bedrock of. Uh, of bluegrass at WAMU uh, and has uh, has been so for, for many years. So uh, let's have uh, another hand for Gary Henderson and Dick Spotswood. <laughs> Dick, Dick, was it you that took the idea to uh, management and what was their um, their response? I know that they were largely educational radio and lectures and and maybe some classical music at that point, uh, back in 1967. Um, how did you uh, approach management about this situation? We're going back into the Paleolithic era here. Before there was NPR, who remembers NER? Who remembers NET? National Educational Radio and Television, right? That was our time. This was an outgrowth of American University. They had uh, a half hour pre-taped weekly jazz broadcast. And I didn't think it was all that good. So I thought, if they let that guy on, maybe they'll let me <laughs> So I proposed doing half an hour bluegrass, very much in a kind of coat and tie professorial style. I figured if I used three syllable words, maybe I could pass the audition. <laughs> so, it, no, it was, it was like little classroom lectures with music in between. 
And that tells us how to start it out. The programs were scripted and everything. And I don't know, listeners then can tell me how stiff they sounded. I remember hearing one of those old shows recently. They didn't, wasn't as bad as I remember. <laughs> so we, we got away with it the way it was. But it wasn't until um, I got into a, a fit with the management over some broken equipment that scarred for life a, a rare Charlie Monroe green wax RCA 45 RPM. I mean, all you record collectors know how painful that would be. And I bitched about it over the air. <laughs> and the, the GM got very unhappy with me. And uh, I just, what did Johnny Paycheck say? Take, Take his job. <laughs> well, at our pay scale, it didn't matter, you know. <laughs> I was getting paid every bit as much as Gary and vice versa. It was, you know, love and dedication of the music, and we, we gave it the best we had. But I knew, as, as nice as my program might have been, the first time I heard Gary doing that program on the air, and coming through with everything that had made his approach, his love, and his knowledge and understanding of the music, everything he had brought to AM radio. I mean, this is aside from the refrigerator commercials and everything. You know, the, it needed that AM radio uh, enthusiasm to sound like something other than public radio on public radio. And as soon as I heard Gary the first time, I said, I should have given this up years ago. <laughs> and because as Lee said, that's what, I had a nice, respectable thing going, but when Gary started, it took off. And then Gary took over. Gary named the program Stained Glass Bluegrass. What's in a name? That name took off. Don't we, we now, didn't they say we now have stained glass bluegrass that's on multiple stations? Now? Yes, that's true. Yeah. I have to correct you, Dick. The actual uh, credit of naming stained glass bluegrass was the, was the news director, Craig Oliver. Craig, Craig Oliver gave us the name stained glass bluegrass. And I thought you couldn't find a better program for bluegrass gospel than stained glass bluegrass. Yeah. So it, it stuck. Unless it was kicked. The lesson was kicked to. No. <laughs> kicked, you can fill in the black bluegrass. So, were you a were you already a historian of music and doing research before you started doing the radio show? Uh, I, I had a little record company in the 1960s, and we we put out Skip James, we put out Red Allen, we put out uh, the, uh, the the hillbilly Red Allen, not the horn player. And uh, uh, Joe Buzzard's Jug Band. It was a little experimental, semi hippie folk long play. We got through about a dozen releases. We realized that we were not cut out for the record business, and that quietly went into oblivion. Uh, I also, during those years, was having some very severe problems with an intestinal thing that was going on with me that I barely survived there for a while. So I was. I had power sometime, and other times I wasn't in, uh, in such great physical shape. I nearly checked out once, and so all this was going on during those critical years. So it was another reason that Gary Henderson's energy was so vital and came along at the same time. It was exactly the formula that we needed because Gary's broadcasting and his information, everything was every bit as intelligent as anything I could master. And carry what? Carry to the. You know, I mean, there's no substitute for that kind of personality. I couldn't do it, but uh, I was glad to have something to do with the phenomena that created Gary. And then Lee coming along. When Lee started, I started enjoying rock and roll broadcasting for the first time. <laughs> Lee was Lee was playing with Adam and. But Lee wasn't just playing your, your favorite greatest hits. He wasn't playing the he don't be cruel over and over and over again. <laughs> Lee was finding some, some very deep and interesting and experimental music. And you had the All Night Show, didn't you? For a while there, yeah, I did, yeah. I was doing rock shows uh, from the mid-70s to the early 80s before um, I saw the light in bluegrass and they decided to ask me to uh, host the New to Three show right before Jerry Gray and uh, 
Of course, Katie Daly is here, and she was such a big part of the, the bluegrass scene. And we love her for that. And uh, Gary, were those first shows, they were a half hour long, and did yes. they always have a theme? No, Dick produced all four programs. We'd come up to WAMU every Sunday morning to record four half-hour programs. And Dick brought all the records. I brought a few from home. And then, uh, uh, bless his heart, uh, Pete Kuykendall shared some of his collection with uh, Dick and I and some of those classic uh, mossy bluegrass records, uh, thanks to Pete, uh, were on Dick's program on Bluegrass Unlimited, which, of course, was the name of the magazine that we started. A uh, listener at WDOM, when I was working there playing country for the uh, Dillard family, Jean and Everett Dillard, she called me. Uh, her name was, uh, if I can remember, uh, maybe it'll come to me. When you get to my age, your memory bank goes south. Um, but in any event, a, a listener called and said, did you know the Stanley Brothers were playing at a club in Prince George's County last night, Sunday night? No, I didn't know that. Diane, 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 Diane Sims. Diane Sims. Thank you. Thank you very much. Diane is the one that uh, really got the, the magazine started, the impetus for Bluegrass Unlimited. She said, we must start a local Washington newsletter with all the bands that are coming to town so that this will never, ever happen again. And I called Pete at home, and no, Pete was at work, and did you know the Stanleys were in town? No, I didn't know. We called everybody in our collection of friends that knew Bluegrass. Nobody knew that the Stanley brothers were at some Bar in Prince George's County. Princess Garden. And that, what was that? Was it the Princess Garden Inn? Princess Garden? No, I think it was worse than the Princess Garden Inn. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, it, it had cages around the bandstand, as I understand. <laughs> like the Irish Pizza Pub. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. But that's that's how the magazine really started and it blossomed into an international publication when we started getting email uh, letters that email wasn't around at that time letters from australia japan germany how did these people find out about our newsletter at that point hey we've got to go with a national publication this is a winner i mean this is important People from foreign countries are asking about our newsletter. So we capitalized on it. Pete Kuykendall, uh, Dick Freeland, uh, Nick Spotswood, George, George McSinney was part of the organization. And I think Diane and Vince Sims were there as well. Um, John Caparacus, I'm sure, was there. Everybody in the, in the D.C. area that knew anything about bluegrass we decided we've got to make a publication, and that was when the magazine was born. So was that just uh, like a two or four page mimeographed thing? It end? became, it started out as, it's a mimeographed uh, publication uh, produced at Diane's house. She had a mimeograph machine, and uh, it's, it then it progressed to, to linotype and, uh, and much improved after that. Just, just looking through the audience. And Sorry to interrupt. How can I not mention Tom Gray and Mark Dietrich? <laughs> so when did the magazine become more of a 16-page with photographs kind of thing? Was it a year or so into it? Uh, they will probably have to help me. I don't remember. Uh, I was the unpaid editor of that magazine for its first four years. We all were unpaid. We all were unpaid. <laughs> And so Pete got the idea, and I've heard this story about Pete and Mary and picking blueberries or something one time, and they were on either side of a hedge or something. The idea came to Pete. This is probably pure folklore, but that, uh, that he could take over the magazine 
and build it into something that they could make a livelihood from. And Mary said later, I was wishing I could get at him and pound some sense into his head. But Pete quit his, um, he had several day jobs. He, he worked at, uh, uh, he worked at NPR. Electronic wholesalers. And, and, uh, and his radio station. Oh, WDTA. Yeah. And for the Library of Congress and so on. And he decided that uh, he'd like to take over Bluegrass Unlimited. Well, by that time, Diane and I had, had quite enough of it. They we were, we were very glad to turn it over. The other part of this story that, uh, that doesn't get told very often was the, the, uh, the intervention of two blues singers from uh, both from Mississippi. Everyone knows Mississippi John Hurt in this crowd, I think. And uh, John had a number of songs that he had written, and he had some property. But every one of those things published, got published in Pete's Wayward Music. And then uh, a number of other traditional performers came on, Dorsey Dixon from the Dixon Brothers, and most uh, notably, Reverend Robert Wilkins, a guy who recorded some blues with his own guitar accompaniment in the 20s, and uh, another singer from uh, Ben Tony in Mississippi named Skip James, less well known than John Hurt, but each of them had songs that went into Winwood that turned into hits that made big, big money. Anyone remember I'm So Glad by the Cream? Yeah. Okay, Winwood. Anyone remember um, um, What's what's the one that was an old brother for Art Bell? Now, Contact Our Core Blues. Everybody remember that guy singing that on that Skip James song? And he went, Wait, I'm sorry, no, 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 forget it. That was, um, my memory's playing these terrible tricks too, it always cuts out at the worst moment. But, uh, uh, oh, Death was it's not, that's, that's old, that's not a copyrightable song. Um, Anyway, two, two more hits that were, I'll remember them as soon as I quit trying, for, uh, for Winwood, and there was a bunch of money there that was, uh, that was available for Pete to go ahead and, uh, and, and start that off. And so he did. The capital was there, and immediately the magazine took on a much better format and became a, a far more viable proposition than it had before. Meanwhile, you know, the, the program on the... Uh, WAMU was being called Bluegrass Unlimited originally to try to stimulate interest in the magazine, but later on, Bluegrass became an entity in itself in, uh, uh, at WAMU. And did I stop using Bluegrass Unlimited or did you stop using it? At some point, it wasn't, it wasn't necessary anymore. When did it quit being called Bluegrass Unlimited? Well, the program at that point, it was still called Bluegrass Unlimited. Oh, so you no. dropped it, okay. Yeah, well, when, no, I, I didn't drop it. It was when uh, the station offered a program on Saturday morning because somebody was leaving the station, and that, that's when the, the Saturday morning program began. It's a three-hour show. Hmm. Well, that's when, the, the, that's when that Rolling Stone began to gather some moss and that program. Katie Daly came along, and then later on, Jerry Gray came along, Tom Reeder, Tom Cat came along, and Red Shipley, and gradually this program would get more and more consequential. Lee Michael got taken off of his rock show in, you know, on the, what, Saturdays at midnight or some awful time, and Lee took over a show that had been vacated by Ed Walker, what big shoes to fill that was. Yeah. Edward well, was a legend. It just it just changed its it's it was still three hours of music, but it was it was bluegrass music, instead of Michael band, style, yeah. instead of dance bands of Ed Walker style. Right. So that's so once you turn on WAMU during the day, after the twelve o'clock news and Diane Riemann, the regular morning news oriented programming, we turned it over to bluegrass from what, one to six? Noon to 6.30, I think. Yeah. Noon to 6.30. Yeah. So we had uh, about 40 hours a week of bluegrass. If you count uh, Saturday bluegrass, stayed the last bluegrass, and I guess um, when Eddie Stubbs' show came along, you can count that. It wasn't really bluegrass, but it was uh, uh, traditional country and, uh, and uh, Jerry Gray's weekend uh, country and cowboy show. Just so much of the schedule. And it was because fundraising was so good 
during these shows, especially during during your show. And, uh, and when Ray Davis came along, he was he, he was a, he could sell baby chicks over the radio. <laughs> He learned the, uh, the art of pitching at the uh, XCRF in Mexico. The transmitter was in Mexico, and the, uh, the studio was in Dallas, uh, Texas. And that's where Ray learned uh, if you wanted a paycheck, you had to sell baby chicks or the Lord's Last Supper tablecloth or whatever <laughs> else. Um, and, 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 I have, and I don't mean to, to be derogatory, but the hillbillies that listen to the country music and bluegrass, they went crazy with sending in the money for whatever Ray was pitching. Uh, they believed in the pitch, it, it sold, and Ray got a paycheck that week. And that's, uh, he was the best pitch man that I think I've ever heard in one year. Well, he was the best, he was the second best. Well, uh, you weren't selling any baby chicks or anything like that, but no. you, the, the infectious laughter that you would have on the air talking about the music got the uh, listeners to want to keep the programming going and make contributions. And back then it was maybe, you know, if they gave $20, that was a big contribution. You know? yeah. I have to give a lot of credit to my late uh, broadcasting buddy, Mike Kelly. Uh, Mike was uh, brilliant. He was, he was a, a smart guy. And he had, hilarious. He was hilarious. He was well. He he had wit like you wouldn't believe. And it was Mike's uh, invigoration during the fundraisers on Saturday. We had to tone it down on Sunday because we were playing serious music on Sunday. <laughs> and Mike got a little bit wound up. And uh, Mike, this is a religious show. This this is Sunday school and church for a lot of people. So let's make it reverent as best we can, <laughs> as best you and I can. <laughs> and that was a challenge, but we, we got through it. But it was Mike's infection and his jokes. I, I almost fell off the studio chair a couple of times laughing because, uh, and, and the listeners thought, <laughs> thought this was, this was really neat radio. Listen to these guys, and, you know, they're laughing and carrying on and making a fun of pitching on the radio. But to a point, after we had fun, now we're having fun, but this is serious. We do need your help to pay for the broadcasting services that you enjoy every day. So it was successful, but the music sold for itself. We had no commercials. That was a plus. And I still contend that, I, this has not been documented, but I still contend that the reason Bluegrass was so popular on WAMU is there was a consultant, uh, several in uh, California, radio consultants, that would go around to radio stations, listen to the format, make an air check of the, of the station, found all their strong points, and then offered to come down and, if you want to make a modern country radio station, billing more than 300000 a year, We'll, we'll charge 200 bucks for the uh, for the advice. People ate it up, the, the small radio stations, and they uh, said, okay, there's a list of 10 things that you had to do if you were going to make a modern country radio station. Number one, you fire all of your cornball morning radio announcers. No more cornball announcers on the radio station. You hire ex rock and roll jocks that just read the liner notes and didn't talk much. You had a good sales department. You had a news department that was first class. The last thing on the list, if you were going to make a modern country radio station billing $800,000 a year, is you never, ever play a bluegrass record on your modern country radio station. tear down everything you're building up. <laughs> that was the, okay, that's that's the top ten. And there were stations that, that abided by that. And this was, in my opinion, one of the reasons, one of the reasons that Bluegrass was so popular on WAMU. Now, if anybody has any questions, uh, holler out. We'd like you to be a part of this conversation as well. So if you have a 
a question that, that's been needling you, uh, stand up and be counted. I know Tom Gray was uh, around there in the late 50s, early 60s, playing with the country gentleman and um, witnessed your, uh, the rise of uh, bluegrass at the radio station and uh, can probably testify to how important uh, these guys up here were to, uh, to bluegrass and the bluegrass industry overall. Tom, stand up. Tom, Tom Gray. Silver Spring, I'll just make it very, very quick. 
because uh, I heard country music, well, it was called Hillbilly Music on WGAY, our Montgomery County radio station at uh, 1050 on the dial. And uh, I was bored because uh, I didn't study for my arithmetic test that particular Friday. And uh, I told my mother I was sick and I had a belly ache. And mother said, yes, right, you do. If you're sick, you go right back to bed. Well, I did. I would turn the radio on and I heard Fiddlin' Curly Smith at the time. I, I learned later it was Curly playing the fiddle on Black Mountain Rag. I'd never heard anything like this before. And I thought, well, this is interesting. I'll listen a little more. And on comes Fiddlin' Curly Smith. Hello, friends and neighbors. This is your old buddy Fiddlin' Curly Smith with two hours of Radio Rodale, your favorite hillbilly, western, and folk music. I never understood where he got the folk music because he never played any folk music and I was familiar with it, but that's okay. That's how he started the show. And the first record he played was a killer of a record for bluegrass, and I just fell in love. And he started the show off. Here's Bill Monroe and the Bluegrass Boys, and sweetheart, you done me wrong. And I thought, oh my goodness, this is, is that a banjo? It's not played in the in the spectrum some style of banjo playing, it's played with a finger picking style. This was all new to me. And at the time in 54, it didn't have a name bluegrass. It was all called hillbilly music. And I just got hooked on, on the music, I in radio. Uh, my dad took me up to the radio station later because I wanted to meet Curly. And on Saturday, they had the Buzz and Beat the Bayou Boys, P. Pike and Buzz and Buzz Me, and uh, Don, uh, not, John Hall? No, 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 it was bad. Uh, Donnie Bryant, the, the pick and five string, um, at the top of that particular show. And they had uh, Benny and Valley Kane and the Country Clan, and uh, Slim Morrison did 15 minutes of a Hank Williams song, just a, just a guitar. Well, that's, that's what I was growing up with and uh, loved, and the radio was it, and uh, my day job was National Public Radio, Saturday and Sunday at AMU, seven days a week. The Saturday, the Sunday program came by kind of an accident. I was walking down the hall, and one of the news secretaries came to me and said, we have some slots open on Sunday, and I'm surprised the program director didn't approach me. Uh, and uh, would you be interested, or is it feasible to do a, a gospel bluegrass show? And I said, yeah, it's feasible. In, in the, this period of time, there weren't too many bluegrass gospel albums, but we made through it. We, we took away the old 78s that I had in my collection. The mossier, the better, is what I was said. Uh, classical bluegrass gospel, and uh, that was a hit. And again, Mike Kelly was my cohort in raising money. Uh, the listeners just were very generous to, to us and the station as a whole. And I have to give credit to the listeners to, to Bluegrass Country and Stained Glass Bluegrass because you folks who were there at the time in the late 60s, early 70s, built the foundation for what we have now as WAMU-FM at American University. You built the station during these critical times. Before I, I I'm not going to talk any longer, I want to give credit to a gentleman sitting in the audience who's been very important with the bluegrass country. He's an engineer and he hired me as the second technician at National Public Radio. Dick Cassidy, would you please stand up? What? Do you remember the um, radio host who's mentioned in the National Register from 1978? And do you know how that all happened? Are you talking about Senator Byrd? Yes. Okay. I was walking down the hall. We were listening to the uh, 
And to the Gary's life, Gary was the engineer. By the way, this was the first national radio broadcast bond of the session of Congress. And we had to, all the wires, we had, we had to, all of the senators wired up. If you were sitting back there, you were running all the controls. And I would walk in, we're going to take a, a brief break, a recess, and we'll be coming right back. Then we heard, uh, everybody, ladies and gentlemen, this was rough. Um, I, I, want, I, I want you to know something. I want you to know that my friend sitting back there with those controls is Gary Henderson. And you know he's got the best bluegrass <laughs> on the radio. And you know why he said that? No kidding, Gary. He played Robert Bruce. <laughs> Even though Senator was not the best bill for you. God bless Senator Bird. Uh, he, uh, I was, I became his programmed radio station when he had something he wanted to hear. On, he heard on MCQ. He would have his secretary call me at home. Are you available for a call from this, from Senator Bird? Of course. <laughs> yes. When is he calling? Uh, shortly. I'll, I'll call him and tell you. Tell me so if you're available. And uh, sure enough, Senator Bird called. Senator, how are you, sir? Gary, how have you been? I liked your show last week. I heard something on the radio by, and again, it was a country record that we didn't have at the station in the library. We weren't, uh, we didn't, didn't receive commercial records uh, of commercial country products. So uh, <laughs> I, I called Gary Balaban, who was the program director at WMZQ, and I said, Gary, I, I have a senator that heard one of your songs that you played on the air. Would you happen to have an extra copy of so-and-so? And I don't remember what it was. Sure, come on over and get it. I'll have it for you in the, at, the, at the secretary's desk when you walk into the studio, into the station. And I said, well, Gary, I, I really appreciate that. And uh, sure enough, I had the record, and Senator Bird was listening on Saturday, as he always did. And uh, I had to play something from his record album, which came out at about the same time. You could, couldn't ignore it playing Senator Bird in his fiddle album. And I thought, this is a good song that uh, Senator Bird uh, called me about and, and brought to my attention and listen to the lyrics of such and such, and I played the record. And uh, Senator Bird called me quite often after that, asking for <laughs> requests, and I was, uh, I was delighted to play. He requested bluegrass songs that he heard on my show and said, would you find that record and play it again? And I said, Senator, you know I will. <laughs> and uh, it, it, <laughs> I was so honored, and uh, yes, Dick, I am in the congressional record. Uh, the, the senator was uh, padding for time for a senator who was supposed to be on the floor to do continue the uh, the debate, and so he was filling time, as I did on the air uh, many times. And I have to, somebody asked me, you know, what is it about your show is so believable? Is you're human? You make a mistake and you point fingers at yourself and you make fun of yourself, and people love that. And I was doing it because I didn't want to have 15 seconds of dead air. Uh, when I would play a record, I would introduce the record, a 45 or something, and it was the wrong side of the record. I said, oh, jeez, now what a, well, he turned the record off, and, uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, Gary needs a third cup of coffee this morning, he's played the wrong side of the record, and of course, while I was running my mouth, I was trying to get the record queued up and, and ready to go. By the time I finished my dialogue of uh, poking fun at Henderson, the record was ready to go. Now I think we're going to hear the right side of the record. Well, this was a stake that I, I did uh, just because I didn't want to have 15 seconds of dead air. People would say, well, now Henderson's completely lost. We have no audio at all in the air. So that's how that came about. Can I tell a Henderson story? One of my favorite moments on the air. We're over time. Go ahead. Oh, are we sorry, I, I'll, I'll make this oh, as short as I possibly can. This was a moment of pure genius. I was in the car, turned the radio on, and I'm hearing the end of a 
record that was not by the Osborne brothers at the end of a sequence of gospel music here in Australia on Sunday morning. And it goes on and, and, uh, and, and is back announcing what he's just played. And he said, uh, and to that listener who called and said that I played Jesus shortchanged me, I said, I didn't play it. They didn't sing it. Jesus wouldn't do a thing like that. <laughs> Been <laughs> I almost drove off the road. <laughs> well, our thanks to Dick Spotswood and Gary Henderson for some great <laughs>